So why would you want to listen to a fisherman when it comes to doing stock assessments and biomass assessments? Well, it's pretty easy to explain. There's a YouTube channel that you might want to start following if you haven't already. It's called Lehman Talks. It's part of ground fisherman Jerry Lehman's campaign to get the word out on the unfeasible doomsday level cutbacks being imposed on fisheries by their managerial class. If you watch any of my videos, I mean, I start to break these things down in, in explanation. There is such a disconnect from the way things are to what they want them to look like. It, 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 it's absurd. Jerry sees catastrophic shortages in the works if arbitrary new reductions in fishing quotas are not rejected as well as irreparable damage to our natural resources if offshore wind farms move forward unimpeded. He's been calling out the assumptions of NOAA fisheries as being increasingly distant from the textbook definition of what science is supposed to be. And it certainly doesn't resemble the real world he and other mariners navigate every day. I've only spent the last 21 years offshore, I mean, watching these things day in, day out, night and day. All hours, all seasons, weathers and storms, me. I'm nothing special, but you know what? There's hundreds of other folks that have seen these things. He sees that populations of fish he catches are thriving, but the government says that their own surveys indicate that the fish are in severe decline. The fall survey tow was 42 nautical miles of bottom towed, but yet a dragger like me on a slack day can tow 48 nautical miles. Hmm. One day for me, 700 gallons of fuel towed 48 nautical miles, while their fall assessment for the, in their 66-day survey towed a big whopping 42. So I'm going to break this down so people can see with their own eyes what that kind of looks like. So this chart depicts about maybe five-eighths of the Gulf of Maine off here to the east. That bottom is all Gulf of Maine too, but it's not depicted on this chart. 42 nautical miles, the door is probably spread 300 feet. So all combined, if you would end friend every tow they made, you would have just towed down this one edge to about there. So that is what they're basing all their knowledge for this fall assessment here in the Gulf of Maine out of all this area. I mean, granted, their toes are more like, not even that big. I'm, I'm way exaggerating now. Two there, maybe three there, maybe two there, maybe two there, three there, 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 there. there. nothing. This line right here, I could literally make two long toes with my flounder net and do the same thing. Now in a 66 day survey, that's all they can manage to do. That's ridiculous. That is beyond ridiculous. That isn't even enough to have an assumption on. So that there don't fly. Yet that tiny amount of data collection has convinced the feds that there's not enough fish to go around, so now they're reducing the allowable quota by shocking amounts. They're asking for a 13% reduction on white hig. They want an 84% reduction on the haddock. Based on what? Nothing. Jerry's been poking holes in the practices that the feds are basing their assumptions on. So let's talk about haddock. Well, they're now saying that they can't find any small haddock. If you want to catch a small haddock or see smaller haddock, you have to tow at night. That's why after all these years that I've been towing around chasing haddock around, I've noticed that once the sun goes down, school gets out. And that is when the little fish come to bottom to do their feeding. Obviously, they don't want to be down there on the bottom with the bigger fish during the daytime because they end up on the dinner menu. And then when the daylight strikes, that's generally when the bigger run comes back to bottom and the smaller run goes back up in the water. You generally don't see the smaller run up in the water. They tend to disperse and you really can't even see them on your screen. But trust me, they're there. That's the problem with assumption models and these random toes. You know, they're there for 20 minutes. Random predetermined toes do not work. They pick random toes 
before the boat ever leaves to do research. Well, they've only accomplished a whole lot of not much. Well, here's the thing, when you pick random places and random times of the year, and you don't check the same place over and over again. You are never going to know what the biomass is if you don't know how to look and spend enough time looking. I'm using this as a table of contacts. There's a codfish spread out where the codfish generally live, which is pretty much inside. There's a little bit of cod down to the southern, certain times of the year. You know, and occasionally you get the scragglers. They just broke away from the pack. Had it come from the east, deep water, stouts, all the way down the edge. Had it all the way across the edge, all the way up that cape. There's another body of haddock that sits just inside Tilly's. It works its way out towards Platts, Pippinies. Redfish primarily live off the redfish bottom, which is east of caches, and they primarily live every now and then on the humps. Now around Franklin's, there's a body over in there that goes all the way to the southern. And there's another body that just kind of just sits on the humps in patches. There's a body of dogs hanging around here to the east. There's another body of dogs that are pretty much taken up all down through here and up the fence. There's another body of dogs. Everybody's gaining with them from off and on. So picking random spots like this, so let's just say, here's random spot one. Well, yeah, you might see some codfish, you might see a little bit of haddock, but guess what? You're not gonna see any dogfish or anything else. But then again, you might not even see the haddock or the cod. Same thing with the reds. Reds are finicky fish. Reds like to primarily stay up in the water as a school and come down as a school. Same thing with a haddock. You may get to a piece of bottom, like such. But you see all these little, little these little lines? These are bodies and schools of fish. And then there's another body of fish up in the water. This lower echogram is telling me everything in there is from seven and a half inches, 15 inches, and we got higher. Fish on the bottom start at eight inches, 12 inches, and we got some bigger fish at 39 inches along the bottom. So guess what? making a 20 minute tow if it wasn't slack water or if it wasn't the right time of the year, those fish could very well be up in the water, just like over here. So this was just last month. This is the bottom of the, the ocean floor. Very little bit of fish on bottom, but we also see these schools, one, two, three, four. Four lines, so that means there's four bodies of fish. They could all be different species, but like I said, unless they touch on bottom, that bottom trawl is never going to know. Doing random models and assessments with randomness does not work. One, because in 20 minute tow, you don't know if these fish are gonna come down or not. You're relying on the assumption that they're all on bottom. Picking random areas and doing 20 minute tows when these fish can very well be up in the water, just like my charts are showing and just like my pictures are showing. And like everything else, these babies move. So, and as they move, you can go into an area, not see anything at all, but yet the migration of the fish have already moved on. They like to tow one depth all the time. If this is an edge bottom, starting at 30 fathom, 50 fathom, and 80 fathom. So if they decided to make a tow around 70 fathom, which would probably be somewhere right around here, they would not see any fish at all. Fish could very well be up somewhere around 40 fathom. Fish could also be somewhere around 80 fathom. But if they're in 70, they're gonna have a big fat zero. Just because you're in a certain area, if you're not in the right depth, you won't be catching those fish. So that's why randomness and pre-selected toes will never tell you anything. They have a three to one protocol on the wire. Let's just say if they're in 50 fathom of water, they gotta set 150 fathom of wire. If they're in 100 fathom of water, they gotta set 300 fathom of wire. But here's the problem. They seem to be doing fine at 50 fathom, but when they get shoulder, your net will overspread. And now your net gets more narrow. The fish could be very well up in the water and you would pretty much slide right by those fish and never even know they were there. When I fish in the shoal water, sometimes I might even have to set five to one because of the tides and how they run. Otherwise it'll force the twine down. It's just what it is. 
You know, that's the difference between having a bag of fish and not having a bag of fish. But it seems that NOAA Fisheries stock assessments are geared towards not having a bag of fish. And then by doing an insufficient job of finding fish, they say, we aren't seeing as many fish, they must be in decline. And they slash the quota for the entire nation. For a popular fish like haddock to have its entire allowable harvest chopped by 84% in one year, you'd think that the government would at least want to get a second opinion from the only people in the country who are experts at chasing down fish before they cut off our food supply just like that. But so far, none of the powers that be have answered any of the questions that Jerry's been asking. So he's been going public to try and get answers from the government. I'm always available to talk. I know plenty of fishermen that are available to talk and give their input of the natural order of things here in the Gulf of Maine. But you're not talking to us. Jerry's also been educating people on how crazy the policies are that are arbitrarily making key species of seafood, which are in abundant supply, economically unfeasible to even harvest. That's what the boat has to pay. Now you add in the 10 cent unload fee, the 20 cent lumper fee, I didn't even add the fuel in time, but you add the ice at 30 cents a pound, roughly average. The auction's only paying the boat at 250 a pound for the codfish, and that's auction price, dressed weight. So you're already down the hole, $5.40 to every pound you catch before you left the dock. Now you gotta add a 10 cent unload fee, a 20 cent lumper fee, a 30 cent ice fee. Now you're negative $6. You're getting 250 from the auction. So you're still not even coming close to even making a profit. You are $3.50 to the pound for the boat to catch a Gulf of Maine cod. Now that is just codfish. Now they created hate to be a problem as well. So do you see where these choke species now become a problem? Those $4.50 lease cod, if you catch a pound of fish, a codfish up above this red line, you are now going in the hole $3.50. Now, as far as hake is concerned, they don't judge that by golf mean, Georges. That's just abundance and all around. The math does not work out for you to pull a profit. They're either really unknowledgeable and don't know what they're doing, or they purposely know what they're doing, and they're literally choking everybody out. These things need to be addressed. The U.S. fishermen is getting screwed on every level you can imagine. They want to put windmills out on our ocean. This is a land grab going at sea, pushed by big energy. Our nation's security, our food resources, our fundamental economy, the heritage that started our nation is in jeopardy. The 17 blue water boats left in New England. There used to be 400 vessels 20 years ago. Now we're down to like 17 working boats. That's nothing. The thing is, that what, what, what's going on here can be fixed. We can do accurate assessments. I know we could. I know that the working captains in the fleet are more than willing to put the time into the efforts. I mean, if you can buy a $54 million research boat. That's right. The boat procuring the woefully insufficient data used to choke off our seafood supply cost the taxpayer over $50 million, and it's used to do a fraction of the work an average dragger is capable of. 42 nautical miles towed bottom. Well, guess what? That vessel cost us taxpayers $54 million, plus they dredged the harbor at $2 million. Now let's look at a basic dragger. If I just made four tows per day, four hours per tow, four tows, four hours, 16 hours towed per day. 16 hours at three knots is 48 nautical miles per day. 48 nautical miles times 10 days is 480 nautical miles towed. Fuel costs, well, my boat roughly 750 gallons a day. 10 day total fuel, 7,500 gallons. Average price, $5 a gallon. 7,500 times $5, $37,500 for 10 days. So what do I got? I got roughly under 40 grand in expenses. And so far, these guys are running a little over $56 million. NGOs have gotten in there, spent millions of dollars to push these things so fishermen's voices are no longer heard. Well, you know what, my brothers and sisters, fishermen and lobstermen, enough is enough. We need to stand together united. This has just got to happen. 
you know for years we've all talked about it and everything else you know what the petty differences between each of us you know what we'll, we'll, we'll wait for a different day to talk about those things but what we need to talk about right now is getting accurate data assessments the thing is is there is a fishing supercomputer and it does not lie in some AI model at the Woods Hole Institute it lies in the minds and the generational thinking from each fisherman and lobsterman that have been passed down from generation to generation. But we don't tap into that because, you know, we're a fisherman, what do we know? We didn't go to college. No, the university I went to was the University of Hard Knocks and Mother Nature beat it into me. There's only 30 blue water ground fish captains left in New England that fish from George's Banks to the Gulf of Maine. You know, there's a thousand NOAA employees. There's like eight NOAA management teams to every fisherman. You're telling me out of a thousand agents you couldn't find two employees to make 15 phone calls? Hell, how about 15 employees to make two phone calls? Or better yet, just find 30 out of a thousand to make one phone call apiece. Funny, I've been raising a stink for two months now, I go, and yet nobody seems to have been able to pick up a phone to call me and ask me anything what I think. You know, these faulty assessments and everything else, well, it's got to come to an end. This is crazy, and it's been crazy for too long. The ball's in your court. I'm not stopping from this. This is insanity. It's absolute insanity. What Jerry's talking about is something that everyone in his fishery has observed. The common thread through all of our fisheries seems to be poor data collection. So he's organizing a group that will seek to reform the stock assessment protocol by having real people gather real data and then use it to advocate on behalf of all fisheries in the USA for realistic regulations. It's an idea that could be a real game changer, unifying the voice of every fisherman across the country. At the Maine Fisherman's Forum, uh, March 2nd through 4th, we will be there with a booth to pretty much give you guys a blue collar working man insight of how these things work. And we would be happy to ask any questions or, or, or give some feedback to anybody. Um, these things need to be addressed, and they need to be addressed now. I mean, Pretty much from all I'm gathering is this is just a bulldozing mechanism just to get everybody out of the way for mineral rights and windmill rights for the for energy. If anybody wants to reach out and get in contact with us, we'll make sure that we, uh, well, our profiles are, we're being very transparent here. I mean, anything you need to know about us is pretty much on our profiles, so feel free to look at them and share them. In the meantime, that YouTube account is Lehman Talks. Get it? Fish out.